So up next is Scott Campbell. Scott Campbell is one of the, uh, the old Bro users. He's been around for longer than I have. <laughs> He's, I, I don't know when you started using Bro, actually, but... A long time ago. Yeah, I know that. Uh, so Scott has been doing really cool stuff with not using Bro to sniff network traffic. So Thanks. I'll let him go on that, though. So here's Scott Campbell. Thank you. Um, so since Ashish threw down the, uh, the challenge of having too many slides and too many things to talk about in a small amount of time, um, I'm going to see if I can beat that. I don't have quite as many slides, but I think they're more dense. So I may speed up or freak out or whatever. So just kind of work with me. Um, so this whole talk is about um, pretty much I don't touch network traffic at all. I talk about using Bro in the capacity of um, host-based analysis. And so I'm going to talk about, you know, since I don't want to talk about just one thing, I'm going to talk about four separate projects that we've got going on. Um, one that probably everyone's heard about and seen many of these slides before is the uh, instrumented SSH, um, the eyeball. A bunch of new work I've got going on with Audit D and kind of analyzing that data, the brain. Um, and then two kind of mini projects I've got going on, uh, an API that we're defining to help instrument a bunch of stuff that I'll talk about and then just kind of persistent user and system data, which is just two slides, kind of quick. So this is kind of a, exactly what I just said, instrumented SSHD. The security API was kind of interesting. It's kind of our, our answer to the web two point whatever um, mess that we find ourselves in, in that there's all this complexity and all this stuff kind of gooped on top of Apache that is kind of important. And, shot full of bugs, and we, um, this is our, our way of trying to figure out how to deal with that. And then just, you know, the persistent user and system objects is just, you know, a database, really. Um, there's some other projects we're working on that I don't have time to talk about, including a web, uh, an Apache weblog digester, which turns them into actual, you know, bro connections and bro objects, which is kind of handy. And then a new syslog analyzer that uses the input framework. So using Bro to, to kind of chew up non-network data has proven to be kind of interesting because you know the language itself is totally source agnostic. It just doesn't care where the events are coming from, and that's kind of liberating because you know an event is an event, right? So um, you can kind of mix and match, which is kind of cool. We're just using Bro ultimately as a state engine, right? It's got this really handy language, and it does all you know the tables and timers and whatnot, and um, it's really cool. The data sources, really, it's just anything you can parse. And this is, you know, I wrote this slide even before the input framework, which is tremendously exciting when it showed up. Um, but really, any structured text that you have, you can hand to Bro. And it's, you know, it's kind of cool. And then the idea is that you have this stream of data, this stream of information and events, and you can just apply local security policy to it and make decisions. So the general, the general flow of stuff is you have this mass of you know, semi-structured, messy raw data. And you, the you know, hard part is always normalizing the data to end up with a set of key value pairs. And then you hand it to Bro. And, you, know, you use the input framework or broccoli or something to turn those key values into um, an event stream which then you can digest in exactly the same way that you might network traffic. So we've got, you know, so this event comes in. And kind of like the way I've been handling everything is you have this normalized thing. And the first thing you do is you log it, you know, because we love logs, right? And you want to be able to look back at it um, years later on the fond memories of that event. Um, the second thing that happens, sometimes in parallel, sometimes not, is your local security policy gets applied to it. And finally, uh, a bottom piece, which I think is critical and not really thought about a lot, is you need to have a way to do asynchronous analysis, whether that's a researcher that wants to see the data or whether that's kind of like some post-processing you might be interested in doing. Even though I know you're supposed to be able to do all your analysis in Bro, 
Sometimes there are other tools that might be useful. So, our problem at NERSC, right? NERSC, the place where I work, it's a supercomputing facility. We have a lot of stuff. We do big data, open science stuff. You know, we have six major platforms. Um, the transition is done. We have a 100 gig internet connection. We have over 4,000 users worldwide. Everybody has SSH, shell accounts, password authentication, diverse code bases, everything gets run. Um, now, architecturally, things are changing. Things called embassy networks are being connected, which is essentially like an entire infrastructure is being bolted onto the back end. KBase is a perfect example of it. It's this project that's doing brilliant science, but from a security perspective, it's totally anxiety producing. Um, and then all of the Web 2.0 stuff. You've got apps now that you can put on your phone that allow you to interact with the job scheduler on the big computers, and that is a problem. It's complexity. Um, the way I look at it, we are absolutely not here to do anything but enable science. We are not here to say no. It is our job to figure out how to make it go safely and not to say, you can't run that, you know, unless it's incredibly stupid, but you know, we work with it. So given this mass of problems, you know, I would sit and think, and, and you know, the first piece I came up with is, you know, is the instrumented SSHD, which is you know, kind of what I'm going to use as the, as the beginning example. So the design decisions. You know, we actually sat down with the system administrators and a user group representative, representative and kind of came up with a bunch of design decisions about how it is that we were going to do the first uh, brush at the instrumented SSH. And, you know, and then I looked at other things that I saw were, were wrong with all the tools that we have. And the first thing is like the data has to be normalized because arbitrary data is almost worse than useless because it's, it stares at you and it's clear that there's something useful in it, but it's all gobbledygook and you can't machine parse it, so it's crazy making. Um, URI encoding, it is a beautiful thing. You can take arbitrary bits of stuff with spaces and binary goop and turn it into a string that's safe to handle. Um, and then you can parse on that, and that's cool. Because if you have, you know, you can just handle it so much easier. Um, disconnecting data flow, logging, and policy. Again, this is kind of, this kind of like the bro model, right? But you don't want uh, issues in the pipeline to stop things um, backwards. So if, if your bro crashes, you can't have your SSH infrastructure stop working, or the users will be very unhappy. Um, metadata is valuable, keep it. And um, at least for SSH, um, for the SSH stuff, we wanted to look at the keystrokes. But not only keystrokes, we wanted to look at the as data. We want, so we want to look at channel traffic, which is kind of cool. So, um, so moving to the SSH itself. This is kind of like a really simple <coughs> breakdown of the information flow. And so you have, you know, what I'm going to do is just kind of walk walk through. So, you know, I'll, that will get refilled back in. So you got your parent SSHD, right? You know, SSHD, yay. You connect to it, forks, and life is good. So you get the box on the right side. That's kind of like your new process space. And you get the session object, which is just this thing that you um, can fill with other things, right? Authentication information, channel information, all this stuff that, you know, ultimately we will log and do happy things with, but, you know, for now, we'll just talk about it. You get a channel. Channels are kind of like the tubes that go along in SSH, and things happen in them. You know, standard in, standard out, standard error. You can throw data through them. You can do almost anything you want. They're really, really cool. And you can have many of them within a session object, hundreds sometimes, if, say, your users are forwarding web browsing traffic off of their supercomputing node because they thought it would be a really cool thing to do. I don't know. But they do that. It's amazing. Um, so the next thing that happens, yay, you get a shell. 
happiness, kittens, bunnies, chickens, everyone's seen this slide, so um, it's not nearly as amusing as it was the first dozen times that I saw it. So sorry if you've seen it before. Um, but at this point in time, you have an interactive shell, or you've executed something remotely, or you've done port forwarding, or whatever you have SSH doing, because SSH does, well, damn near anything. Um, it's really powerful and really useful, and obviously then, you know, really dangerous. So that's what's going on in SSH. What we did is we just decided to have SSH tell us what it's doing and to punt out this information in clear text in, you know, as a series of, of well-organized string structures. So this thing here is kind of like what comes out of SSH. Um, you can you can print it to a file. You can and what we do in production is we throw it at an S tunnel, which on you know I'm supposed to have a pointer, but I hate pointers. So on the the client you know on the the server end you have a non-blocking local Unix socket, which is one end of an S tunnel, and it just the SSHD just you know barfs all this data into the into the S tunnel and it comes out on the other side. And this is what the data looks like. And I'm not going to go through each line because it's not that interesting. But essentially, the first line is the event identifier. So it's you know data that comes from the server. And then you've got timestamps and where it came from and the versions and, and whatnot. Um, that's essentially what the raw data looks like. And so it's kind of, it's interesting. Because at this point in time, you can kind of eyeball it and see what's going on. But we will do better things with it, of course. Um, the log mux, which is this, you know, because there are many, many uh, systems that we, have work, that we have running this, hundreds. So they all connect to a single point, which uh, is about to be replaced with a piece of Python code, thank you. Um, and they all write to a, they, what amounts to a big file. Um, multiple hosts, hundreds of hosts deliver data to the log mux um, as users type and do things. And you know, we just end up with this big honkin' text file, which sounds kind of awful, but at the same time, it's absolutely neutral. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't go anywhere. You can read it, you can grep it, you can deal with it really well. But as far as actual information content, it's, it's low, you know because you have bro and you want to use bro, right? So you naturally, you take this text goo, which is on top, and you throw it at the input framework, which is probably the coolest thing ever. And it just converts it into an event, right? And events are super awesome because they, you can hand them to bro, which then does really wonderful things with them. What some of the basic, you know, just a, I, I snipped a whole bunch of slides out of here, so suddenly we like lurch into grow policy, and I apologize for that. Um, just an example of an event is uh, data server. You know, so this is data that comes back. Data client is what the user types. Data server is what the user sees, and um, that's essentially what an event looks like. And the interesting thing here is the data string, because that's usually what we do most of our. Um, event work on. And there's a bunch of stuff. This is an example of, um, oh, there's a fly up here. Um, remote execing things. So if you have had a pile of Unix boxes for any amount of time, you know that typically when someone comes along and remotely execs a shell, you know, with sh-i, um, chances are they're up to no good. So we're darned interested in knowing when that happens. So there is an event that happens when you remotely execute something. And I have a list of things that are interesting to know, like sh-i or bash-i. And so we can just append interesting things to there. There's a whole bunch of shells. There's a whole bunch of commands that I want to know about, um, like foosh. And so this is just an example of adding the foosh shell to the list of things that um, cause my pager to buzz in the middle of the night when it goes off. And it's always the middle of the night because, well, if any of you have done operational security, that's what happens. Um, so this is an example of what, 
what we see. So I'm sitting there on my machine, Spork, and I SSH to something remotely executing sh-i. This is what I, and run id, this is what I see. If I'm an attacker, I'm happy. You know, I'm not as happy as I'd be if I was root, but you know, who can be that happy, right? What we see on the server side, this is all of the, the, the bro logs now. We see, you know, in the black, we see a connection starts. There's all of the authentication information. You get the fingerprint of the key, so we can compare that against known bads or known, you know, known goods even. Um, all of the authentication information. We authenticate, life is good. A new session starts up, a new channel gets created. You always get channel zero. And this tells you a little bit about it, and that's not all of that exciting. Um, and then we exec something, and stuff happens, and life is good. So the thing that interests us is that. It says you remotely exec sh-i, which obviously you know, makes us unhappy. And that is just a, a log example. You know, it's not that it's not that exciting. This is a typical attack. It's kind of been trimmed down to fit on one slide, but um, this is another sh-i remotely exec. Believe it or not, on an older system, unset hist file, cd dev shm. You know, this is all kind of unusual stuff. They grab a tool, they compile the tool, they run the tool, and the tool fails. Because, you know, this is a happy discussion. So things that we can look at that are kind of interesting is we have behavioral things that an attacker does, and we have data values. You know, your average um, climate scientist will not see this in their day-to-day -day activity. So, you know, it's kind of fair to kind of alarm on targets and looking and, and you know, there are the hacker community has done a really nice job of standardizing on kind of a series of tools and vernaculars which we can use to um, catch. In fact, Metasploit has done a fabulous job of kind of poisoning the attacker community into making everything look exactly <laughs> the same way because everyone wants to look like Metasploit. So um, a lot of exploits are really easy to catch simply by the, the brackets and the pluses and the minuses and the dots. Um, because no one else does that except for attack tools. Kind of handy. Um, the last example I have, and this I'm kind of zooming through the SSH stuff, so if you have any questions, you can either just raise your hand and yell or um, talk to me after. So this is kind of a fun one, a soft data. So we had an attack come, and you know many of you have probably seen this slide because it's one of my favorites. But, um, and there was two attackers moving in parallel, and they were using uh, screen to communicate across the same SSH connection. And so there was like attacker one and attacker two. And they actually, you know, they went on and on. And it was actually a really interesting exchange because they knew a lot. It was eye opening because these were not script kitties. They were doing, they were engaging in kind of like system analytics. They were really looking around to understand the system and attack it appropriately. They were doing exactly what I would have done. But it was kind of fun because, you know, they they figured out that they were on a fairly large node, you know, of like 10,000 worker nodes behind it. And they kind of, you know, had to stop and smoke cigarettes and decide exactly what was going on. Um, but what the point of this is, is there's more to, to the data than just simple, you know, grepping out patterns, is you can understand the psychology and the skill set of your attackers by, you know, when they're nice enough to throw all of their communications across an instrumented channel. But um, this, um, this, just, this is just kind of a, it was almost eye-opening in that, you know, you always think, eh, ask your kitties, whatever. But um, this is kind of fun. So that is the instrumented SSHD. It's run um, the the GSI SSH folks have been kind enough to put the um, patch set in, so you can get it that way, or you can just download it. There's patches available. You can download um, tarballs. And there's an entire, all of the bro code and all of this is also publicly available. This is, you know, you can download it and, and run it today. Um, this is all open and free. In a similar vein, 
I got to thinking about what else it is on our systems that I want to know about. And you know, knowing what gets typed and kind of informatics about SSH is really cool, but it leaves a big gap in what it is that I want to know what's going on. And so, you know, I thought about process accounting, and then I looked at Audit D, and did a bunch of analysis and figured out that we can probably run it without killing performance. And so I've started the work on an Audit D analysis framework, and it's ending up being it's fairly complicated because it's almost like a whole, you know, reassembly infrastructure that has to go into effect, and then you get to apply the fund policy. So, you know, we've we've put together an audit.conf file, which seems to do a nice balancing act between gathering data and affecting performance. Um, you get this output, which is, you know, not unlike the SSH output, except it's a whole lot messier because it's the raw audit stuff. So you, you normalize it, and you, you, you categorize it into classes, and I'm going to go through all of this, um, with a little Python script, which is kind of cool. Um, use my favorite S tunnel, toss it at the analyzer. The analyzer converts it into events via the input framework. Um, and then suddenly you have an event stream. And then you do a bunch of stuff, which I'll go through. I had to invent a whole new worker type and um, ways of kind of abstracting a lot of the behaviors. And so that was, you know, kind of interesting. We'll go through that. This is uh, more or less a schematic of what it is that I was just waving my arms about. So you, you, end, you start with raw data at the top, and that's just what comes burping out of Audit D naturally when you hand it the configuration file. Um, you normalize the data, which means, you know, just like with the SSH stuff, you URI encode everything, and you strip out all of the dangerous stuff, and you, you turn it into well-defined um, key data pairs and whatnot. Um, and then you hand it to the core. And so essentially, just like before with SSH, I have, you know, I essentially I have a core layer, I have a policy layer, and then I have uh, a higher abstraction layer, which will you know, essentially use to interact with it. Um, so the, the events come to the core. We have identities and we have actions, because in Audit D, um, the, an identity is just like, who is it that is doing this? And who is it kind of lasts a long time. But the actions, which are ironically called events in the vernacular of Audit D, so I'm not going to use that word again um, in that context. I'll call them actions to avoid total confusion. Um, you can have a bunch of actions for each identity. And so you have to do a certain amount of juggling and reassembling, because you can have a bunch of these before you're interested in actually seeing the aggregate information. And so you can kind of glue them together and then hand them to the policy layer. And I have lots of examples and whatnot going on. But um, I'm going to start with kind of the data normalization. So what goes on is you have raw data that comes burping out of Audit D in wherever it is that you tell it to go. And what you do is you take all of this stuff and you categorize it into one of six things. And each of those six things has, is well-defined. It has an you know, exact number of fields. Those fields are always the same. Whether or not there's data in them doesn't matter, because you know, this is, has to be handed to a machine, which Audit D output seems to not be interested in being easily machine parsable. So that's what we're doing here. We need to be able to just, you want normalized data. Um, and that's you know what I'm talking about here. You just tunnel it over to the analysis host, which is where all the fun happens. So all of this stuff I'm talking about, this is what the raw data looks like. So I do something, and you end up with these things. And the, the, I highlighted some of the more interesting stuff. Type is what's really going on. You know what is exactly is happening here, and then. A key is something that you can just assign arbitrarily in the configuration file. So what I'm doing here is I'm just running grep. But you end up, you know, all of these, these three are kind of informing. They're also, they're filling in the top one. So it's not like you can just, you know, chew these up one at a time. You have to do more clever things. And in the vernacular of what, of 
oddity. You have e actions or events, you have records, and you have fields. And so the, the entire action, the thing that happens that you're interested in is all in the red box. It's composed of a bunch of records, which is a blue box. And the records are full of fields, which obviously the green box is just an example. And just key value pairs, which are you know kind of messed up. So this is the, the raw data. If you normalize the same thing, it's a whole lot cleaner. You, you know, the, th the top ones become a syscall object with very well-defined fields. And everything is, um, you know, the colored boxes. Uh, you normalize things. So you un when the raw data comes out, the syscalls are numbers. You know, which, what number is it in the internal representation of what the syscall table is, which isn't super useful across multiple machines. The user IDs and group IDs and all that are numerical. And so what the normalizer does is it converts it to the kind of string representation, which is going to be um, more globally comparable. So um, you know, I want to, uh, the stat system call might not have the exact same number across all of the systems, but it will be called the same thing. So we convert it. And a user ID might not have the same number across all of the systems, but it's all Scott C. So I want. I want the, the least, um, the most system agnostic representation of the data. Um, URI encoding, just another example. No spaces, no nothing. So you can just move around these blobs of things that are well defined. And um, the data is just normalized. So it's not, there are always the same number of fields, and they always represent the same things. And you think that that wouldn't. You'd think that it would have done that already, but it doesn't. Um, so kind of once you get to the analysis system, those six object types that um, are defined in the, the, in the normalization happen to map to six events, which is actually quite handy. Um, they kind of break up into two different things. You have, you can think of them as three things that, that you're super interested in, and then these three things fill in information about those. So you end up, you know, you have a syscall that may have a bunch of information about it in these. And so I'll, I have a more slides that will tell you all about it. But um, from this, this stuff, I mean, I'm going to fill it in, like I said, you end up with an identity and an action. And so this is. The input, you have these things. The core reassembles this stuff into a pair of identity and actions. And then you glue them together and hand them to the policy analysis. And this will make, you know, I apologize. This is the first time I've done these slides. So, um, and I made most of them in the past week. So there's going to be a certain amount of redundancy and confusion. And I apologize ahead of time. Not that that helps, but, you know. I know I'm making no sense, at least. Um, so this is where things get kind of extra complicated, so I'll apologize ahead of time. You get the identity is used to kind of track things that go on over time. And you know all, the, all of the actions that happen, they all have the same identity. So you essentially have two tables. You have an identity table and then a bunch of actions that are attached to it. And so what I call them are primary and secondary events. The primaries define the action, and the secondaries fill it in. Um, kind of like I think I have a very gay. Um, you build data structures out of this. So you get your identity gets, if it doesn't exist, it gets created and then filled in with the blue one. And then the green one fills in additional information into the um, action field. This is totally confusing. And it's even confusing me now. And so god, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm stepping away. This is the last set of these slides, so um, yay. Uh, so auto policy. So like 
what are we going to do with all this stuff, right? Um, so I have these I action identity pairs, which are, you know, you can essentially think of that as like a, a piece of information that's useful. So what do you do with it? Um, you can map network activity to an identity. So like you see a connection coming out of your network, and you're like, who did that? Well, right now it's like a total effing mystery where that, you know, who, you, you can kind of like identify what IP that came from, but who is the user? What was the process ID? I want to be able to track that down because I'm just kind of a control freak about that stuff. As well, you know, you get a new listener on a system. That's kind of useful and interesting to know. You can watch your users where they traverse um, permission space. You know, they suddenly become root. You know, if they haven't gone through an SUID binary, that's kind of interesting, right? Um, as well as you get like authentication in, in crypto functions, you get data about that. If your users are execing things in strange places, that might be kind of good to know too. You know, not many people should be manually executing things in, say, proc or dev share mem. Um, system activity, all of the like logins, audit D stuff, audit D changes, a lot of cryptographic stuff, um, all gets punted out, and that's also really good to know. And then finally, I have some file system activity flags as well. So um, you get streams and patterns of failed attempts at reading or writing. Yeah, you know, again, good to know. Someone's probably doing something they're not supposed to, or possibly doing something that they're, you know, just not doing right. And maybe you can help them because this doesn't have to be this punitive uh, arrangement. So the one I'm going to go through in some detail is mapping a network connection to an identity. Because um, this, I think, is kind of a useful and interesting thing to go about. So I'm going to take a step back to the, the universe of system calls, because unfortunately, that's where we have to begin this, um, this mess. So the system calls that related to network activity, there's this pile here. I'm not going to read them, because you're perfectly capable of reading them and probably know them as well as I. Um, but you have you know, the socket. You, that's for initializing a connection. Before you, you know, before you accept something or before you make an outbound connection or a listener, you need to create a socket. So you know, that's a good, good place to start. The next one's a connect. It's outbound. The next one is a bind and a listen. You're setting up a server. And if you have if it's an accept, then you're accepting a connection to a server. You know, so you have this really handy thing that you can kind of like figure out exactly what's going on. And um, along with audit D, you get all of the arguments with the system calls. So it's, you know, if it's AFINet and you know stream, then you know it's TCP over IP. And that's really cool too, right? Um, especially if you're filtering out all of the other crap that you're un uninterested in. Um, so if you see a socket like that and a connect like this, you can call an event. Hey, we're finally back at row, right? Um, so you want to register an attempted connection outbound. So what are you going to do? Because you don't actually don't have like the whole five tuple, of course, because you only have you know the destination IP and the destination port and a vague idea of what your own host name is and a timestamp. So my solution to that is a whole new worker, um, which is like, it's technically just another bro worker, but its job is not to analyze data either on the network or through the input framework, but to kind of correlate stuff. And so reading system logs, you figure out that an outbound connection happens. And so, hey, you register, you know, you, you create an event. And essentially, you give the async worker as much information as you have. You know, this is, this is everything I know about this possible outbound network connection. And at the same time, you're just, this is, and this is just a regular bro instance sitting on the network doing network things, right? Because bro does network things, I, so I hear. When it sees a connection outbound, probably from a given IP space, because you know you don't need to 
look at everything, it will register that to the async worker as well, which is awfully handy. Now, the async worker, it knows these things, and you can correlate the two, because at least to a degree of probability, because you, you have the node, you have the hosts, you have a time window. And what's kind of cool is then is you can take this identity information and hand it back both ways. So this, you could, the async worker will hand a connection ID back to the, the, one, the um, analyzer on the bottom saying, hey, this is the connection attached to this. And it will hand an identity piece of information to the network worker. And so everyone will be kind of on the same table as far as this process ID and this user from this host made this network connection. And generally, that's going to be a non-issue. But you know, as far as forensically analyzing things, that can be kind of cool, handy even, especially when a system gets compromised. So as far as what I've done so far, all of this is not done. It's in terrifyingly alpha form. A lot of all of the server side stuff is done. Um, stuff crossed out, I have at least prototypes working. And the rest of it will kind of crawl along as I have time. But again, like the other, um, like ISSH, this is all publicly available. It's on a Git repository. You can watch my mistakes as they happen in real time. And um, so I'm looking to, at some point in time, you know. Shares it, share this with the community. I intend to run it in production. Um, simply because of the discontinuity between data gathering and data analysis, you know, I can crash the bro end repeatedly, and you know, our users will not be any the wiser. The last two things I have, I think I'm going faster than I expected, was the, oops, I was supposed to have removed that. Um, sorry. This is the, the second to last slide that I added. Is, is, our, is our security API. And so looking forward from where NERSC is, is trying to do is we're, we're, there's like the whole mission of how it's doing business is changing in that you know, it's, it's moving way up. It's moving up into the application layer as far as our exposure. We're hooking up other networks. We're hooking up other applications. Um, we can't instrument everything. I mean, we just have to accept that. You know, it's like the first stage of the problem is accepting the fact that you can't instrument everything, and um, or control it, or really understand everything that's going on. So you have to figure out a way to to deal with that because you're responsible for securing it, but you, you don't always get all the data. So what we did, wow is a mess. Um, so we created a series of um, security primitives where we're like, what is it that we want to know about? We want to know about new users. We want to know about authentication. We want to know about execution. We want to know about job submissions and all this. So there's like just a small number of things that we define that um, we're interested in seeing, but we want to make make it as simple as possible for the end um, application developer and administrators to be able to provide us this information. So essentially, what we're like, OK, what in the world can't syslog? Nothing. You know, if a shell script can trivially syslog, Java, Python, Perl, you name it, you can send a syslog trivially. So all, we, all the API really is is a series of well-defined syslog messages. And then we already have the listening infrastructure on the syslog. And so suddenly, you can instrument shell scripts. And you can instrument web 2.0 goop. And you can instrument this and that without very much work at all. And so that was kind of our next step forward. And what that mute is for is an example of why it is that I'm really, really interested in doing this. There's a really, there's a really cool project called Newt at NERSC, which is the NERSC Web Toolkit. And I just cut and paste. This is the very, this is my just-in-time slide, um, which I put together like about 45 seconds before I came up here. Um, and I just cut and pasted it off the nursc.gov, right? 
This is everything it does, and it's all over a web API. That's like everything, right? You can execute commands, you can authenticate, you can directory list, you can submit jobs, um, you can move files around. You persist in object storage. That's like a nice way of saying, you know, you can load files, right? So this is an incredibly powerful thing, but we have no eyes on it. So you know, this is this was the impetus for the API, and now now you know we have all this information without burdening the developer community, who are already busy trying to get this to just work, um, and it's 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 working out pretty well, and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, what the ultimate set of um, security primitives that we chose, you know, and, and we can easily add this. It's you know because it's as simple as it is, you can just add another one, and you know, no loss, right? It's just a syslog message, you know, authentication, an example of sending user data, something gets executed, a port forward, connection event, a job gets submitted. Or like a service registration, which seems to be, that's our kind of blanket, um, you're asking us to do something kind of event. And if it looks like we need more, we'll add more. And, um, but it's just, it's mostly the idea of providing the ability for our developer community, which is really interested in you know, doing the right thing and making things secure, with a simple way of handing us the information that we want and need. And then at the same time, we can also look at the Apache logs, but this is a lot more clean and clear and exact about what's going on. Um, the last slide I have, and this is actually, I'm going much faster than I thought, which is kind of cool, um, is just the need for long-term historical records and information about our users and our systems. Because of what we do, we have a set of known users, and we have, you know, our systems are pretty well defined. and so. We're interested in knowing about things that change over history. And you know, databases and Bro haven't always played well together. But you know, I was started the project doing with a bunch of like function callouts using all this stuff, and it was it was really unclean. Um, and it never got off the ground because it was so unclean. And now, with all of the SQL light. Um, so this the next step, and I have not really uh, gotten much farther in this, but um, thank you. <laughs> Is we're you know we're going to start exercising the SQL light because it's just built in now, and so it's easy to um, take advantage of this. So you can have a database entry of all of the areas where this user has logged in from, and it's like built into Bro now, rather than having to be this outside call. So that's really handy, and uh, so we're very excited about that. And this all kind of fits in together. Um, so if I haven't confused you, or bored you, or both, or made you want to never hear me talk again, um, that's cool. Questions? I'll make a comment. <laughs> I would love to see a con.log that has a username and a process ID attached to every connection, that would just be cool. And, well, and what you're doing is getting to the point where that'll be possible, I suspect. Yes, if it came from, an, if it was an outbound, outbound connection, eh, actually you could also have inbound connections. Um, it, it would be possible, yes. It would, it would they be would be probabilistic assi assignments. But, uh, exactly. It's, it's best effort. Like mo Almost everything that we do is best effort. But I, I think it would be fascinating to actually have con.log where it just sort of pre-bundles the whole thing for you. And you don't know how much work went into getting that to happen. But from the analyst perspective, they're like, well, that's the user that was running that process. Yeah. That's cool. It's also really dangerous. <laughs> so you know. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How long does it take you uh, to find a compromised login uh, when an attacker gets on the machine and then you actually stop them? Ah, uh, yes, I didn't add that slide. That was last year's slide. Um, 30 seconds. I went and actually 
compiled all of the data from all of the account compromises that we had over about a three-year period. And the average time between the user logging in and the email or page being sent is 30 seconds. So we've used this with tremendous success, both um, forensically and um, actively. <laughs> yes, it was a slide which um, had something to do with a federal case that um, made the headlines a while back about someone, you know, selling supercomputer access for some astronomical amount of money for a user account that we had shut down. And I think that one was about 45 seconds. But uh, it took five minutes to decide that it was an actual attack, since we don't like to lock user accounts on, you know, without spending a couple of minutes at our due diligence. So, so how much money did they spend for 45 seconds of access? <laughs> I, I, I think. Uh, no, no money was actually spent, but uh, it was a lot. It was like fifty thousand. Some there are a lot of zeros. Are you are you worried about that, or have you put any effort into trying to? It's honestly, this is a um, walk before you run. I think the fa it's really, I mean, once you get Audit D running, it's kind of hard to get around it because it's, it's built so low into the kernel. I mean, you can attack it in user space, where, but you know, I will probably build in the same heartbeat functionality into that that I have in SSHD in that you know, once if I stop hearing from something from an SSHD listener, I get an event happen. And it's like, I've, I've stopped hearing from that. So you might be, you know. yeah, it's, it's, it's both a really hard problem and a really easy problem as long as you accept the fact that you can't build a perfect system. All right, I think we're going to have to stop there. Thanks, Scott. Okay. That was great. Thank you.